Hey everybody, Jason Spangler here, the CNT Swapper. I have another unboxing video for you. This one is going to be interesting because unlike some of the collections that I get in, I know very little about what's in these three boxes. Now, this is 52 pounds of scouting memorabilia. Suspiciously, one of these boxes may be full of books. Uh, that's, that's too bad. I didn't communicate very well with the collector, uh, the scouter really, I should say, who had this collection and uh, reached out to me and wanted to know if I would be interested in buying it from him. Uh, we talked a little bit on the phone and through email just a little bit, and he agreed just to go ahead and mail it to me and let me evaluate what's here so I could make him a fair offer. Um, ironically, that's kind of how a lot of the deals that I get work out because I'm dealing with people who um, are, have a background in scouting and they recognize that, you know, I'm sort of the same as them having been an Eagle Scout and Vigil Honor member of the Order of the Arrow, all that good stuff. So you're kind of dealing with two people that are trustworthy. And so what they will sometimes do is send me the stuff and then I'll evaluate it and I'll make them an offer. And so that's what happened in this case. So I've got a few pictures of some things that are in here, but I really, really don't know what's in all these boxes. And so I think this will be an especially fun unboxing video to film because I don't really know what's in here. And uh, hopefully it'll be kind of a surprise for everybody. So we'll get started. I've got three boxes. Just to kind of get it out of the way, I'm going to start with this box, which I believe is books. And the reason why I say that is because uh, it's just a very heavy box. It's very, very dense. Uh, this box is 17 pounds. And so it's, it's the smallest of the three boxes, but that tells me that it's probably going to be some books. Now, what do I have against scout books? Uh, honestly, kind of my thing is that I have in my warehouse just boxes and boxes and boxes full of books. And uh, it's like they breed in the night. I really uh, try not to buy them in collections because it's hard for me to rehome them and to find other people who are interested in trading for them or buying them from me. And, you know, once you have a 1960s Boy Scout handbook, typically they would have made, you know, half a million of those in one printing. Um, they just aren't, they aren't rare. They're very cool. They're very special. And a lot of the information in there is still very valid. But as far as collectors go, it's just not something people are really chasing down. So that's kind of why I'm not super big about getting books in collections. And I usually tell people just to uh, keep the books and don't, don't send them to me. <laughs> but having said that, I will definitely recycle all of these books. Because as you look here, for example, this book from Knott's. Uh, let's just take a look at the date. Just kind of get an idea. 1969. So this book is one that I could give to a scout at next uh, meeting that we have in person. I'm filming this during the middle of the coronavirus, so we're not actually meeting in person. So this is something that can be recycled. Uh, this is the kind of thing I actually give as gifts sometimes. If I had a scout master friend who had something significant, um, I might would give this. This came from Boy Scout Troop 28. I'm not sure exactly where Troop 28 was, but that's cool. Junior leader training events. Another old Scoutmaster handbook. So these books are great. I just have all of them in my collection already. Um, I'll give an example of that. So uh, like almost every collector, I have a collection of Boy Scout handbooks. And this one's from 1957. This is the fifth edition. So just of this book right here, which is you know pretty old, they printed 525,000 copies of this book. So just in terms of rarity and collectability, um, it's not going to be rare. This is an exploring handbook. This one's kind of interesting. I actually have this in my collection as well because I collect explorers. So this one I think is, um, this is after the explorers stopped their, their um, rank advancement program that would lead to silver. So this one's more focused on sort of career awareness and that's kind of where that explorer program went. Then here's some cool things that I think you could use, you know, how to train junior leaders in the patrol method. I mean, how does that ever get old, right? I mean, so anybody who gets elected to senior patrol leader in my troop, I could definitely give them that, the outdoor program. So there's some good training material here that I'll definitely recycle. I have given away a lot of these over the years, Boy Scout songbooks and my son's Weeblos Den. I've been the, I was the den leader of all the way from Tigers. And so I remember giving these out to all the boys when we did one of the belt loops. And so uh, it's kind of fun to give an old scout songbook, and we've used that before. Uh, now this is kind of cool. I haven't seen this before. Wood badge training. Somebody might actually want this. 
because I've not seen that before. This is literally a notebook that has spaces for people's handwritten notes, and this one's pretty full of handwritten notes here. Um, and I just haven't seen that before, which is kind of interesting. I've seen a lot of books, but I haven't seen a, a wood badge notebook. Another field book, again, just a golden thing that really never gets old. You know, the topics like fire making, hike, cooking, cleanup, observation, wildlife, um, scout craft. These things are, are just ageless, you know, so this is a really cool item to have. Um, the requirements have changed quite a bit from 1965, 1969. So these are kind of interesting to go back and see what the Eagle required merit badges were, some of which don't even exist anymore, and just to see how things have changed. So that's kind of cool to see that stuff. Somebody might like to have this, talk about stepping into history here, the Great Owl Catalog. So for years and years and years, this is copyright 1965, the Grey Owl Company sold all of these Native American regalia type things that scouters uh, would buy, especially folks in the Order of the Arrow, and a lot of OA lodges use this. And so I'm looking here on the back, there's some notes scribbled on the back, probably where somebody was making an order. Uh, so this was out of Jamaica, New York, that's the Grey Owl Company. So again, just some more books here, stuff like that, seen that before. Always love getting old OA handbooks. This hasn't changed very much either, honestly. Um, and there's a membership card that just fell out. Okay, cool. So he was a member of Thunderbird Lodge. And this was 1964, it looks like. So I know some people even collect cards with uh, different lodge names on it. So if you're one of those guys, hit me up and maybe I'll have a card for you. So again, just some other program helpers. Again, these are pretty cool. Good stuff that can still be recycled and used. Cub Scout Magic, I've seen that book before. Troop Activities, 1960s handbook. Huh, this is kind of interesting. The Explorer song. So here's a little record. This looks to be like a 45. The Scout March, instrumental and vocal. I'm not sure I've seen that record before with a, they call that the Rocket V on there. Skits and puppets, games for Cub Scouts. So again, kind of some classic stuff. I know if, I know someone I could send this to who's kind of a big Cub Scouter. So let me uh, load this back up. We have two more boxes to go through. Um, so again, this is a collection, if you're just uh, watching now, that I got from a gentleman. He mailed me the collection. I'm going to evaluate everything and then make him an offer to purchase it. And uh, that tends to happen pretty often, actually, because people are pretty trustworthy and they just want to rehome this stuff. You know, he's held on to this stuff now. 1960s, I mean, do the math, for like 60 years. He, wherever he's moved, he's hauled this stuff around. He hasn't gotten rid of it. And that happens to a lot of scouting stuff. People just don't want to get rid of this because they remember their childhood and especially with men, I've, I've been told. That's kind of a thing for men. We, we sort of collect our childhood and so he's held on to this stuff for a long time. But as people, um, you know, move or get older, there's a time where they have to I'll look at what they're still dragging around and maybe the family is not that interested. Some people have reached out to me and said, you know, I talked to my family, nobody in my family wants this stuff. And so they reach out to me to try to recycle it back into the hands, the hands of collectors and scouts. And so, you know, I'm definitely a collector. I'm definitely actively involved in two different units. I spend my summers out on the lake at a scout camp, being a camp director. So some of the, some things I can even just put them in the trading post or donate to the camp and give away. So I'm definitely still in the middle of it. All right. I don't know what's in this box. This will be fun. Uh, see what's here. Some packing materials here. Get those out of the way. Got a little box. Let's see what's in there. Carefully taped up. Okay. It's like an old box that uh, photo film would have been in. All right. Aha. Okay, some equipment items here. So two belts and garters. Yep, that's all that's in there. So uh, back in the day, the red would have been worn by scouts, the green would have been worn by explorers, and these are pretty much your standard web belts. So um, what I have in the, in the back of my warehouse, actually, I have an entire tub Nothing's in it except for web scout belts, so I know exactly where those will go. 
and I have another container full of garters, and that will go in there. So what I do is I'll go to a Boy Scout uh, tradery where uh, collectors uh, get together, and I'll have those uh, tubs with me, and uh, anybody who's looking for one, they can go in there and pull it out, and I'll make them a very, very sweet deal on it. So those will kind of get recycled back there. All right, next up we have a shoebox. Let's see what's in the shoebox. All right, so here's, here's the first patches. So this is when you can kind of start to get an idea of what is sort of the guy's history in scouting. And so uh, this gentleman, uh, this came from, sorry, I'm reading here, okay, North Dakota. This came from North Dakota. And so I don't know if he, he grew up in North Dakota, stayed there the whole time, or moved around. But anyways, when you start looking at the patches, it's a little bit like a... Um, uh, forensics is what I should sort of jokingly say. You can figure out what someone has done. So here's a back patch from the 1993 Jamboree and also some other paperwork from the 93 Jamboree. So somebody went to the 93 Jamboree. Now, whether it was this gentleman or whether it was uh, his son or another family member, I can't say, but um, definitely stuff from the 93 Jamboree. Um, Orange County Council, that's also from that Jamboree with a pin. This could have been something he traded for. North Dakota Centennial. So again, the guy, the package is from North Dakota, and then here is a worn shoulder patch from North Dakota. So, I'm, and this is 1989. So, my guess would be this guy was living in North Dakota and later in life was an active scouter, um, because that's that's a tip to there. 93 again, 93. Some of the little patches here, things he might have traded for. Here's kind of cool. This is a Polaris. Um, Boy Scout compass still in the original box. These kind of things are kind of neat to give as gifts because they're still in the original box then that kind of makes it a uh, neat thing. Something heavy in here. This has got to be some kind of a table weight or maybe a, oh yeah, okay, so here we go. There's your little, phew, put that on your, your desk there, a little desk weight. BSA Fleur de Lis symbol on it. I was at the 1993 Jamboree and so I remember these. I was a fourth assistant Scoutmaster these are the, the tickets you could use at the trading post. And so what they did was, um, for those of you who maybe hadn't been to one of these jamborees, they would have you buy tickets and then you would use the, the money tickets at the trading post. And I guess that sort of cut down on them making change and counting out everything like that. So these tickets, uh, you still find them as souvenirs. So here's, here's 50 cents that uh, is, is no longer valid, but he still got it there. Here's some cool stickers, some cool Scout stickers. Some of these, that's a newer one, I know. These are classic. I just love these old aqua decals. You put them in water and they come off. These are great looking decals. I love, I used to have those on some stuff. This little USA guy there. What else we got here? World Heavyweight Champion, okay. <laughs> some tickets for a World Heavyweight Champion. This actually is a postcard, so find somebody who'd be interested in that. Let's see what's in here. All right, some patches. These are like uniform patches, so Devil's Lake. Uh, there's a couple of rank patches in there. Winnipeg Centennial, 1974. Lake, uh, there's a camp patch, maybe up that way, so a little envelope of stuff. So this guy looks like also took part in Wood Badge. We saw the Wood Badge uh, notebook just a second ago, and this is the leather name badge holder. You put your name in that plastic strip there and you wear that on your shirt. Just a little pouch there. A little leather patch, 1963. Here's another compass that I can recycle into the hands of some scouts. These are just some cords here. You click on your stuff to uh, carry your gear around. Really, really carefully packaged everything. Everything's like wrapped up and stuff, so this is really nice. Here's a nice Cub Scout knife. I actually gave my son one of these when he became a Cub Scout, so that's kind of nice. A couple of other things here. Nothing. To, I'm seeing some coins. I see a little ring in here. Weeblos colors. Nothing too exciting. This bolo. I used to wear that bolo in college, actually, back in the '90s. I think maybe that was one he got back during the middle of the '90s there. It's cool, like a leather neckerchief slide. It says Kenton Trailblazer. Nice little leather neckerchief slide. Let's see what's in here jingling around. Okay, so he's got a little box here of, you know, uh, neck neck uh, clasps and uh, yeah, tie tie bars, that kind of stuff. That's what's in here. 
on those guys. Let's see what else. This is kind of a miscellaneous. <laughs> I don't know why this would be in there. 1973. It's its own little presentation box. I guess that was a big patch or something. I don't know. Just a little flirtily guy there. Let's see what else we got. All right, here's a cool neckerchief slide. Nothing on the back here. I'm not sure what's supposed to happen there, but this is a, a hand carved wooden neckerchief slide. Really good uh, craftsmanship. That's that's pretty impressive. Might be a keeper. And then here's a slide from someone from the Jamboree 1969. On the back, it's got the address of the guy who did this. So this was kind of something back in the day. People would make these handmade items in order to trade at the Jamboree. And so shout out to Bob Reagan from Corpus Christi, Texas. Uh, your neckerchief slide has been found <laughs> that you made and you traded at the Jamboree. Okay, a couple of other things in here. Just some woggles. Woggles you'll see all the time. I actually have a whole box full of woggles as well. So if you ever catch me at a tradery, you can find those. Uh, more leather neckerchief slides. You know, you see a lot more neckerchief slides from these type of collections because scouters back during this time period, you always wore a neckerchief. And so there's a lot more neckerchief slide. That was kind of a way for someone to kind of individualize their uniform because they have some interesting neckerchief slides. So again, you're gonna see, in these old collections, I see lots and lots of neckerchief slides. Um, that's really cool, this aluminum one. So these aluminum ones, they're actually, um, people might have seen on Facebook or YouTube, they're, they made these for camps as well. And they're kind of, there's a little niche of collectors that really like those and go after them. So and then here's, this is like a leather composite material. It's not quite leather, but it's kind of a composite material. And this, we see some neckerchief slides made on this. This one's um, Lake Agassiz Council. Uh, Boy Scout Exposition, but again, not quite leather, but it's some kind of a, a tough material like that. And then also, this is another little classic slide. I love these guys, these little hats. So 1966 Exposition. And so again, it's a neckerchief slide because you right through here, you'd be able to put your thing. So that's a cool stuff. So yeah, this is a really cool little box just of all the knickknack stuff. But you see how, again, I said earlier, people don't throw any of this stuff away. So he held on to every little piece, every little slide and uh, didn't get rid of any of it. So I'm gonna kind of put it back in here and if it'll go back, you know, it packed so well, it might might not fit back very well if I'm not doing a good job. But anyways, at least try to, oh, that pepper looks heavy. Okay, let me set this down over here. And then maybe I can use this to kind of get the rest of it containerized again. All right, there's still more to go. All right, uh, reaching down in here, here are some garrison hats. And it's got two, two garrison hats and then also an explorer garrison hat. And so uh, interestingly enough, these are actually wildly popular for scouts to get at jamborees and things like that. Um, and they're worn just a little cock to the side. You don't wear them straight down. Um, of course, the BSA got away from this in the 1970s. This is more of a 1950s and 60s look. They got away from these that looked a little too military, I guess, and uh, didn't give you too much protection from the sun, come to think of it. But these garrison caps are kind of still things that especially youth that I uh, trade with uh, really like. Here's a 1969 Jamboree belt, and I have a whole box in the back full of just uh, leather style belts. And so this one right here will go in that box. So it has the uh, adjustable waist. This waist is a 32. And it's got the Jamboree buckle on it like that. So that's pretty nice. All right, here's a box right here. Don't know what's in this guy. Let's open him up and see. All right, they need some good stuff. All right. Now, what would this be? It's just a green cloth. Literally nothing on it. I'm not even, I don't think that's anything necessarily scouting-wise. All right, you got to love the red berets. So scouts in the 1970s, when they went away from those garrison caps, they wanted to be, I guess, uh, fashionable. And so uh, BSA went with these red berets. Um, and so this is an original. This is a size, um, size is always what matters here. This is a medium because today, I don't know what it is, but I would take like an extra large to get one of these to fit on my head. Uh, this, I won't even tr really attempt to get it to squish down, but. Again, this is another thing that especially uh, scouts today really kind of appreciate this vintage stuff. They like these old hats, uh, berets. So that's kind of a good one that some scout will appreciate getting. 
Here's a merit badge sash with just a handful of merit badges. These are these are not his, so these would have been from the 1980s. Uh, it could have been that 1993 time period again if somebody other than him went to that 93 Jamboree. These style of merit badges could have belonged to that scout, possibly. Again, just kind of piecing this together. Also in here we have some OA sashes, and so both of these are ordeal sashes. And then, whoa, looky here, we got a vigil sash. So this vigil sash, um, vigil being the highest honor in the or the arrow, uh, you can not that you can see on the video, but it's actually very very thick. So this is definitely one that um, is from that time period. It actually is dated 1964. He has a little uh, note on here, so that kind of helps. So this is you can definitely tell the sort of feel and thickness of this cotton. This is a vintage vigil sash, and then he has an um, ordeal or brotherhood sash. And the Brotherhood Sash is dated 1961, uh, I think I saw. Yep. No, no, 62. Okay, so this is 62. And then he has the year on his Ordeal Sash as 61. So there you go. 61 Ordeal, 62 Brotherhood, 64 Vigil. That's pretty, that guy must have been pretty active because normally you don't not necessarily just get Vigil after two years. It's kind of a process you have to go through to be selected for that honor. Okay, going in here is a whole box full of patches, including some lodge flaps. So here we see uh, Thunderbird Lodge. Uh, this would have been, we know that that authority found his membership card. This was the lodge he was a member of, and this is a nice old twill flap. Now, for collectors, condition matters. So the fact that this one has been sewn uh, will kind of make it a ding. Not everybody wants to get a sewn one. They'd rather have a mint one. So then here's another lodge flap right here. And then here's another sewn Thunderbird right there. And we saw already a camp from this council, so we know that that's probably something he was involved in. Northern Lights, which would be up there in uh, that part of the country. And then here's when they go from the Twill. So the Twill is like a 1960s, and then at some point they go to this fully embroidered Thunderbird flap. Kept the exact same design, but you can see the different styles here. This is a Swiss embroidered one, so this would have come after that. And then here's another one. So he has like three different of these Thunderbird Twills, Devil's Lake. This is a community strip. And so uh, what would have happened, this uh, council strip would have been for everybody in the council. Early on, sometimes you had these being worn by Jamboree contingent members. But if it was just your individual unit for a long time until uh, the 1970s, Scouts would have worn just their community's name on their shoulder. And so Devil's Lake would have been the community. We've already seen that. So again, this must have been his council growing up, and we'll probably see some more patches in here from there. He's an international camperie, and so anybody, oh, this says Red Valley Council, so there were a lot of international camperies for folks who live maybe close to Canada, for example, and you would have camperies with other Canadian scouts, which might explain why this is in here, Scouts Canada, a jacket patch, um, so you probably would have traded for that. Here's some just other, you know, random activity patches, bowl-a-thon. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that every collection has. So just to kind of, you know, for people who are watching this and aren't collectors, these are the kind of the, the patches that really don't have very much value because these are um, every district, every council in America is going to have these, you know, activities like expos, scatteramas and stuff. And the fact that one particular council made a patch, maybe 800 other councils that year had a scoutorama so not a lot of people really collect these other than if it's from your area that you grew up in you might want to have a collection of those but they're not terribly um you know valuable this here uh devil's lake elf youth camp so again we saw the devil's lake uh shoulder strip so this might be related to that yellowstone valley council this is what we call a council patch so this patch was not made for an event but rather was a patch for all the scouts in the council and may have been given out for some sort of a contingent type person purpose, but Yellowstone Valley Council, interesting. Again, 93 Jamboree patch, just looking in here. All right, here's a cool one. So this is an old eagle patch. So when I was growing up, we called this a square eagle. And um, one way, I'll have to get up and do a little homework, but one thing I can notice here is that this uh, material is actually very, very thin. You can't see it in the video, but I can actually see the light coming through all the way around this. And when you get real serious into collecting Eagle Scout patches, which people are, that's one of the things people collect, is old rank and insignia, there's actually different versions of this patch, and there's some versions that are on a different type of material. So this has been washed and faded, so it's a little harder to identify it, but
but I, I've got a reference book I can get out and try to figure out exactly what that was. So, uh, again, Circle Rocket, stuff like that, some other patches here. That's just a generic Explorer insignia. Again, 1960s patches from that era. More of that. Here, just more activity patches. Nothing too interesting to show off. Red River Valley again. It's kind of cool when you get into the Bicentennial and you see a lot of patches that have Bicentennial uh, things going on. This was sort of a generic patch, but you'll also see event patches from the Bicentennial year that have that stuff. So National Jamboree, 1969 Gulf Coast Council. I mean, in a minute, we'll probably get into his neckerchiefs. And sometimes the neckerchiefs can also kind of tell the story of someone scouting history because you can tell whether it was worn and washed. So definitely that would indicate probably an event that they went to. Several of these old pink guys right here from 1993. So somebody was involved in 1993 doing something. Aha, uh -huh, here's a little evidence. All right, so we saw already a 1969 um, patch from the Jamboree. And then here we run across one, two, three, four patches from the 1969 Jamboree. And what do they all have in common? They're all sewn. And so that tells me that this, these came off of his uniform. These are ones that he wore at the Jamboree or afterwards. And at some point he took them off of his uniform. So this, this gives me a real clue that this guy was at the 1969 Jamboree. So that's interesting, okay? A couple of other patches there. There's a Philmont Training Center patch. Again, that's sewn. So if it was his, maybe it indicates that he went out there. There's an Assistant Scoutmaster patch from the 60s a Scoutmaster patch from the 50s, Scoutmaster patch from the 60s, um, kind of a commissioner patch there. Actually, not commissioner, but um, blue would have been troop committee, I think. So uh, these are assistant Scoutmasters. So just some position patches to kind of go with all this. Let's see if there's anything else in here. There's a bunch of these. So again, this, I'm assuming, is the camp. Uh, that's an Indian name that I'll probably really get wrong. Wabanagat. And there's a whole stack here from 1965. So uh, maybe he was uh, either on staff or else his troop went and somehow he ended up with a whole stack of these. And then also this is a pretty looking patch, a nice design. So maybe he bought extra of these to trade them. So um, as I look in here, I'm just looking to see if there's anything else that kind of tells the story. This would be a, a, another OA patch, Thunderbird Lodge. So sometimes lodges would make um, patches to wear on your pocket versus we saw a minute ago the flap that was designed to fit on the flap of your shirt. Um, so this one has not been worn, so I'll have to do a little research on this to figure out what was going on there, but that might be a good one. Um, then another old camp patch, Ozarks Empire, which actually would have been in Missouri, so pretty far from Dakota. But I um, don't see anything else in here worth really pulling out. I'm not trying to hide anything. There just isn't too much going on. Um, here's a couple of interesting things. So again, if you talk about, you know, sort of what is his history, so here's some knots. So this would indicate that he participated in, uh, got a Scoutmaster key. Uh, this might indicate that he was a silver beaver. There's actually two of these in here that are silver beavers. One at least looks to be worn, uh, district um, award of merit. So this guy was definitely, seems like he was definitely involved as an adult. So let me kind of put these patches back and we'll keep going. We actually, I know this video is going long. If you're, if you like this stuff, stick with me. We've got another box to go through and I'm not even done with this one, so. Okay, so we got some neckerchiefs in the next layer. And these are always fun because again, back in those days, scouts would have spent a lot more time wearing neckerchiefs. So again, his Order of the Arrow Lodge, Thunderbird Lodge 371. This one's been worn, you can tell there. The silt screen's got a little crack in it. And here's that camp that I don't wanna dare try to pronounce. Again, nice camp neckerchief. It's been worn, obviously. You see the stains on the back. So, you know, these things weren't always Kept, they were worn, right? A couple of standard issue red BSA neckerchiefs. The same design, you probably could wear this today. I mean, it's basically the same, same kind of thing. All right, 1969, these would have been the Jamboree neckerchief that uh, he would have worn. And so this one definitely looks worn. Uh, again, we see signs of wood badge. So this is the, the version of the, the wood badge neckerchief you take, at least back in when I took it as well, when you were going through wood badge, this green one was the participant neckerchief. And then once you earned your beads, you got the one that had the uh, tartan and all that, which maybe there's one in here. I'll have to kind of keep looking. Okay, Camp Wilderness, Red River Valley Council. We've seen a few things from Red River Valley. Then this looks to be that same camp, uh, which probably is in Dakotas. 
and 69 again. Then here's a Weeblows neckerchief. They still, I actually gave these to every member of my son's uh, Weeblows den when they crossed over, the one with the patch on it, because it really hasn't changed much. Now, in the 2020, uh, they embroider this symbol on there, but this, it works just fine. Um, this was the souvenir neckerchief from 1969. You'll sometimes see these. What makes it kind of stand out is it has all of the uh, jamborees, the old jamboree pence on here, but um, a lot of times I'll get these in and they'll still be in the original bag. They were sold in as a souvenir. So here's a troop neckerchief, Great Falls, Troop 4, Montana. That's a really heavy duty, thick embroidered troop neckerchief. That's a pretty cool find, somebody in that area. 93 Jamboree, again, we see that again. 1983 World Jamboree. And then here's several of this 1969. So these, um, this might be a, you know, a good chance for me to mention this because um, I know people watch this video who are not necessarily scout collectors. So let me just kind of you know, hold these up and kind of just make a little statement about Jamboree stuff. A lot of times what will happen is almost every collection that I get, there will be National Jamboree items in there. And people will kind of assume, because they've heard of the Jamboree, they'll assume that these items are valuable because, oh, it's 1969, it's a Jamboree, the Jamboree still goes on, etc. But the reality is there's sort of a, a rule of supply and demand, right? And so in collectibles, what happens is if something, even if it's old, like these Jamboree neckerchiefs, if, if the demand and the, uh, the, the number out there don't equal then the, the value is going to be very low. And so let me just sort of show you that in this one collection, a guy who went to the 1969 Jamboree, I think I've now put my hands on six different 69 Jamboree participant neckerchiefs. And so just kind of keep that in mind. They're literally, of this neckerchief, there were more than 100,000 of these made. So even though time has gone by, these still are not going to be rare. Um, they, they just don't sell for very much and, and the trade value is kind of, you know, sentimental, but it's just not very rare. So just wanted to mention that to someone. I hope I'm not busting your bubble. Uh, the patches are a little more collectible. So like this is a leather pack that you would maybe from the 69 Jamboree that you might want to put on your backpack or something. In fact, it even has holes pre-drilled in it. And this is really meant to be sort of a, sorry, I got it upside down, really meant to be a patch that you put on your pack. Um, and so this is that, and there's also a small round there as well, kind of a souvenir type item. Similarly, you know, going to supply and demand, it's kind of neat to find this in its original wax wrapper. That doesn't, I don't, almost never find them in those, but this uh, generic Order the Arrow jacket patch, while it's very cool, I always like this design. These are super, super uh, common today, not very hard to find these at all, but that's a, a great design. And finding it in the original wax envelope is kind of a, kind of a cool thing for me. Souvenir from, I guess, the 69 Jamboree was this set of belt loops. Sometimes you'll find these loose, sometimes still in the original package. And then he's got some paper items here. So this looks to be just a souvenir thing from the stamp guys in 1969. A couple of other things from 69 in there. Some coins from 69 in this collection. This is probably going to be a pennant from 69. Yep. <laughs> So again, all this stuff is cool. Pinnets are actually a little harder to find. You don't find these as much. That was a souvenir item, but it wasn't something that was as common. Okay, so again, neckerchief, and here he is on staff. And then a cool picture. I'd love to get more pictures in collections. I don't get very many pictures. So this is 1969 Troop 34, a little black and white picture, and a staff neckerchief. So this, my guess is this is going to be a flag. How cool is that? All right, this is cool. Somebody's gonna wanna get this from me. 1969, this is probably a troop contingent flag for the National Jamboree. I can't think of any other reason why someone would make a flag like this and have 1969 on it. And it, I'm surprised it doesn't say the Jamboree, but then again, if he was at the Jamboree, everybody would have known that was the purpose of it. So you can see again the design here from the Camp Neckerchief matches this flag. So somebody in that area definitely will want to get this back home. So I'll, I'll get a few emails about that. A couple of Camp Re ribbons, not gonna worry about those too much. And then these are some uh, these poster sets where they made the uh, ranks where like you kind of have at a court of honor or a pack meeting, you would have the ranks. So that's what these are, um, life and eagle, that sort of thing. 
These really haven't changed much. I mean, uh, the Cub Scout ones have, but you could still use those for uh, a Boy Scout thing. All right, this is his, it says pre-jamboree on here. This might be his jamboree paperwork. That's interesting. I'll have to go through here. This might be something he got from his council. Let's see. No, this is wood badge. Okay, okay, I mentioned earlier we probably would see his wood badge stuff. And so, I'm guessing that's what this is. Yep. All right, so just hold this up for everybody to see. This is his wood badge tartan neckerchief. And this would have been the presentation with the letter and the information about it for wood badge. So I figured that was in there. There's a set of beads in there as well. And then this is kind of cool. What is that? It's kind of cool. It's a beaded piece right there. Don't know the connection to scouting necessarily, but it might have been a local thing that someone did. Uh, let's see what this is. Okay, this is uh, 1969. This is sort of the Jamboree souvenir book from 69. And there's also some, I think, uh, paperwork in there from 1969 Jamboree. So that is the end of this box. So let me kind of move stuff over. We have an entire other box to go. I don't know what's in the next box, but we're about to find out. So thank you for sticking along. I hope you're enjoying this little treasure hunt here. As I said, I don't really know what's in here. So, oh, this look, this one's heavy. Okay, this is 22 pounds. I don't know what's in here. My guess is there's going to be a canteen or some kind of equipment item because uh, I'm just trying to think what would weigh 22 pounds. Um, we've already seen patches. We've already seen the books. So uh, let's see what's in this guy right here. 22 pounds worth. Oh, okay. I should have predicted the uniforms. All right, so this is where we're really going to get this guy's history because on the uniform, a lot of times people would change uniforms but they'd leave the patches on. So it'll tell us the council, the troop, everything like that, okay? So let's just kind of start off here. First off, this is a dark green Explorer uniform. This uh, Explorer uniform looks to be one from the 60s. So there was a time period where once scouts turned 14, they were automatically rolled over into the Explorer program, which originally was kind of meant as an older boy program to keep them involved after they started getting a little bit older. It's always been a challenge to keep high school age scouts involved in scouting. And so this is a cotton one. Uh, long sleeve. This green today is used by venturing scouts, which is kind of what you might say this version of Explorers uh, became. And so it has the universal patch right here. Then it also has an advisor strip. So he would have been an adult advisor, which helps explains why this shirt is kind of big. This is a larger one versus when I see these a lot of times they're like really tiny ones because uh, scouts were kind of small back in the day. All right. And then here we have a nice uh, shirt. Actually, there's two shirts here. Pull these apart here. So again, here's a good setup to show you this gentleman's uh, unit. So we have the Devil's Lake, and that's in North Dakota, Troop 28, and he would have been a quartermaster. And this is definitely an older, like 19, early 60s. This is a cotton uh, shirt, and uh, just a campery patch kind of stitched on there. And then another shirt. This might have been that same time period. I'm just kind of wondering. Um, I'm looking right here to see if I see a spot where maybe a jamboree patch was sewn above the uh, thing because that might have told me he wore this to the jamboree. But it looks like this one's kind of been stripped. There's no, no patches remaining on this one. All right. So here's, 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 <laughs> there's probably a pound right here, right? So an old canteen. Uh, these are the kind of things, again, that when I get in collections, I tend to just give these away to scouts. Um, because there's not really a big collector's market out there for canteens. But again, people don't throw that stuff away. This classic mess kit, I can't tell you how many of these I've given away over the last three or four years that I've been really involved in scouting with my kids. Um, so this one I can tell, it's got all this stuff in it. And uh, that's great. You can just lift them. You can't destroy these things. They're just made out of the stainless steel so you can run through the dishwasher and ready to go. Every camping trip I go on, this is what I eat out of, just a classic uh, mess kits. I love getting these in collections, although they're very heavy to mail. <laughs> Again, another souvenir thing here. This is the original 12 region. So uh, in 1972, the BSA did away with this um, uh, system of having 12 regions, and they went to a system of having just six regions. And so this was kind of a souvenir set of belt loops. It probably came out sometime after that. Still see these around. So All right, set that down. So a lot of scouters from this time period would have had their big wool jacket 
And so these are sometimes called jack shirts. Uh, let me see what size it is because somebody might want to know. Uh, actually, I can't tell you. It's so faded away, I can't tell you. But anyways, um, this has, it's pretty big. I can't tell from my sitting position. This is must might be like a 46 or a 48. It's got a Philmont bowl on it. So he definitely went to Philmont. We saw the patch earlier from Philmont Training Center. And on the back, there is a 1969 Jamboree patch. So again, that would have been the Jamboree that he went to. So that's pretty cool. There's nothing else on it. So that's a nice, clean wool jacket. Looks good. Then also during that time period, Scouts were wearing these cotton jackets. And so he has another one here from 1969 Jamboree. And again, this looks to be a pretty good size. This doesn't look like too small. So I think... Okay, sorry about that. Someone was trying to call me, but I wanted to make sure that the video didn't cut off. All right, so here's a 69 there. Let's see, well, let's see what this is. Now this is interesting. This is actually very, very heavy. It's a wooden box, um, kind of like a, a, a jewelry box almost, but definitely not, not too girly. And it's taped together. Let's take a look at that. That's pretty intriguing. And we've already seen a lot of the pins and that kind of stuff, so I'm kind of wondering what would be in here. Okay, this is what I'm, this is what I'm finding in here if you're watching along. Um, so this looks to be some letters, uh, patch for uh, Region 10. So Region 10 with this uh, guy, the red hat, that would have been, if you're living up in the Dakotas, that would have been your area. And it's like mostly sort of like paperwork type stuff. Here's a letter to him. Um, hmm. I'll just read the letter, it's kind of interesting. Um, Enclosed, you will find a Region 10 patch. As indicated on the attached card, these may be worn by scouters such as yourself, only temporarily while serving on a special regional assignment. We are appreciative of your help at the 1966 Explorer Delegate Conference. We're pleased to send you this patch for your collection. Okay, interesting. So he went to the 1966 Explorer Delegate Conference, and that's how he got this letter. Uh, there's a couple of other things here. Here's a Region 10 neckerchief slide. Another Region 10 item. And then keep going in here. Not sure. Oh, here's a Region 10 neckerchief. So these Region items used to be collected a lot more than they are now. This is actually two different ones. There's two neckerchiefs here. You can tell he, he wore these, but I'm sure he was very proud. This is this Region 10 design was very um, you know special to those guys and very distinct. And so he had a couple of these neckerchiefs that he wore during that time period. So that's what he had hidden in that really cool jewelry case. It's kind of cool. All right, this is actually very heavy. I want to see what's in here. What the heck this is. All right, let's see what's in there. All right. Oh, okay, all right. Whew, you get everything in these collections. So when he went to Philmont, uh, this would have been just a wall hanger that they've sold for years in the trading post. So this is like a ceramic wall hanger that you would hang on your wall as like a souvenir. And then he has here a participant um, thing. And it looks like he did the handicraft course at the Philmont Training Center in 1962. Even has the date stamped on here. And uh, you know, if you start to put two and two together, he got his ordeal in 61, he's got his brotherhood in 62. Probably getting ready for the summer of 1962, he gets goes to Philmont, gets trained to be a handicraft director guy for scout camp and he gets his vigil in 64. So he's obviously very, very involved. And so that's kind of a neat piece right there. I like that it has the date on it. That kind of helps tell the story. And then here's a little booklet about film on as well. And then it has uh, just a notebook with some information. And this is from the 1969 Jamboree. So that's pretty cool. Cool stuff never ends in this collection. All right, I'm not sure why he sent me this, but again, these are, these are scouting memories that he held on to for years and years and years. So this is, um, this piece of rope here, what this is designed for is, um, it's about, if I remember correctly, this rope would be about six feet long. And it's designed so that you could actually, uh, other members of your patrol would have a similar piece of rope. And then using this um, loop here, which has been spliced and also glued together and whipped, and using this, you could connect them together. And so you could put together and make a longer rope if you connected everyone from your patrol, um, if you were doing some sort of a scout skill. So that's kind of a cool item. I might uh, take this to a troop meeting again after Corona when my troop meets and, and see if a scout would like to check that out. Okay, 
<laughs> they don't smell actually, but here's some Scout socks. I got a whole box full of Scout socks. Oh yeah, <laughs> lots and lots of green Scout socks. Uh, these green Scout socks would have been, you would have had those garters that I showed you at the beginning of the video. They would have held up these green Scout socks. And then this is pretty cool. This might be something I would keep is a little Circle Rocket Explorer, just a little tabletop weight. Um, but that's cool. I haven't really seen that before, so that's a, that's a neat one. And then he's got a couple of items here. Um, this is pretty cool. This is not, to my knowledge, official BSA, but the BSA uh, did make something kind of similar. But you have here a hand axe and, of course, a knife. And all of this is meant to be carried on your person. So let me check this out. Um, I love this kind of stuff. And uh, this might be something that I have to hold on to for myself. Uh, maybe see when my son gets older if he'd like to have this. Because he's, uh, right now, I don't know that his mom wants him carrying a hand axe around to scouting events. That's a really, really thin hand axe. I mean, you could not really do much damage with this. It's made by Imperial. That's the, the maker. Uh, really super thin, but um, actually it's pretty sharp. So, huh. That's, that's pretty cool. I like that a lot. That is, And then, of course, with the sheath, you can button everything together, and then you can wear this on your belt. So that is, that is pretty badass if you're a scout walking around with all that gear. Um, in today's scouting, you'd have to make sure that your scoutmaster would allow you to have all these accoutrements uh, on your person. But I know in some troops, uh, once you get to a certain uh, rank, they do allow scouts to have fixed blade knives. I've seen that recently with a troop. All right, a couple of other things. He even kept his fire starting kit, which has been used. Look at this guy, right? So you have, this is the, the spot here. And then you have the leather and the stick to do the... So, yep, he held on to everything. <laughs> this is what my wife's going to say about me one day. He didn't throw anything away. A little match holder. Let's see what else we got here. All right. Now we know what weighed all this pounds. Check this out. This is super heavy. And it's double-sided, just so you can see. Okay, so Boy Scout Troop 28 meets here Wednesday at 7.30. New members welcome, sponsored by the Knights of Columbus. This is a metal painted sign, and there is wood in the middle, and then same metal painted sign here, and of course we can see that this hung probably from the, the, the hall for the Knights of Columbus for a long time. That is pretty freaking cool. He held on to it for all those years. So uh, this is the kind of thing that somebody would, would definitely want. It would look pretty cool in, a, in an office setting as kind of a souvenir type thing. So we'll, we'll rehome that for sure. Uh, it's a little heavy to mail through the mail, but you know, it's all good. And again, here's a film on, cool film on piece. I think we're kind of at the bottom. The only other thing at the very, very, very bottom, this is why he uses this big box was so Norman Rockwell prints in the 1970s, this kind of became a thing. You'd see a lot of Norman Rockwell prints. And so these are pretty cool. I'll have to measure these and kind of see how big they are. Um, these could probably go in a poster frame or something like that. But he's got some cool, and this is the Philmont one. If I, yeah, this is the uh, High Adventure at Philmont. And uh, Norman Rockwell there. And then see if he's got another one in here. Got a couple more. These are cool, I just gotta kinda of show them. So this is the one, I think this was sort of based around the idea of a world jamboree. You still see that sort of design used sometimes to talk about the world jamboree. All of these have names, too. The names might be on the bottom. So this one says Mighty Proud. So it's down right there. And then this one, The Right Way. And then of course this one is super famous, Tomorrow's Leader. So these are, Rockwell prints, maybe on here I can find the year, but I'm guessing it's like late 60s, 70s. That's kind of the time period that all this stuff's happening. So. Anyways, all right, so I would say, based on what everything I've seen here, that this guy, as we saw, grew up, did a scouting in, uh, in North Dakota, and somebody went to the 93 Jamboree. That sounds a lot like a son or a nephew uh, based on the merit badge, doesn't look like that scout um, got eagle. So, you know, conjecture. Maybe what happened was uh, this guy grew up in the 60s, and then in the early 90s, uh, his son would have been in his early teens, went to the Jamboree because dad had been to the Jamboree, uh, but maybe didn't stick with it and get, um, get eagle. And so now, 
you know, fast forward another uh, almost uh, 30 years, um, maybe the son didn't really want this stuff, and so the dad was looking for someone to pass it on to, and uh, that's where he found me. So I will gladly uh, kind of divide this stuff up. Some of it I will uh, give away to scouts that I'll come into contact with through my son's den or uh, the troop that I'm a troop committee member of. Uh, some of it I'll, I'll swap or sell, uh, but I'm very excited to get this collection. So what will happen next, I'll reach back out to him and say, wow, this is some great stuff. Maybe talk to him a little bit about the 69 Jamboree and his experiences on camp staff, and uh, we'll kind of make a deal to uh, seal the deal and to get these items. So if you saw something in the video that you're really interested in, you can uh, send me a message uh, through Facebook. Again, Jason Spangler, I go by Santee Swapper. Um, or if you're watching this on YouTube, you can leave a comment and try to reach out to me and uh, maybe we can make a deal. But anyways, I hope this unboxing was fun. I know it ran long. There were three boxes, 52 pounds of material, but um, hopefully you saw some interesting stuff here. I will try to film these unboxings as I get collections in. I actually have a guy who's reached out to me um, who lives in North Carolina. He grew up in Kentucky and he's moving to Florida and he's just sold his house and he has to kind of get out of his house. So he is also going to send me the stuff uh, to review uh, so I can make him an offer. So maybe next week I'll have another unboxing video. I don't have any other boxes in the office right now just waiting to be opened. But uh, anyways, hope you enjoyed this. Jason Spangler with Santee Swapper. Catch me on YouTube. It's a Santee Swapper YouTube channel. I have a website also, scoutpatchcollectors.com. That's where I post these videos and also a lot of my newsletter that I send out to collectors every week. So thanks very much for watching. Appreciate it.